God, you can't go pour it out if you've never received 
such a time as this, when this world needs to hear that message. One of the biggest ways we know he's a good, good father is Jesus shed his blood for us. Jesus shed his blood for me. You are a good, good father. Then you sent Jesus to earth. Hallelujah. Oh, God, hallelujah. Oh, I feel that, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. Oh, God. The blood that Jesus shed for me.
In the blood of the 
first time without him.
and you are immersed in His Spirit, baptized in His Spirit, then the glory is back. The gl you're flowing in the glory of God again. You are crowned with glory again. But how did it come? With the blood as the foundation. Always the blood. That platform of love Shannon's talking about. He wouldn't have shed His blood had it not been for His love. It all is a beautiful circle of how He did it. Now, when we get into the fall feast, Notice there's a big gap here between the third month with Pentecost and the seventh month with the fall feast. That represents your life on earth. You've already had the blood applied, left the world of sin, gone forward into newness of life and first fruits with Him, been baptized in His Spirit. That's what's going to carry you through those long, hot summer months. Pentecost is late May, early June on the calendar. You've got to make it through hot June, hot July, hot August. There's no feast. On the Jewish calendar, God did this on purpose, y'all. I'm telling you, we can't leave behind the study of this to show us our future. There's a reason there's nothing there. Because He's given us these things to carry us through. That living water carries us through when there's no rain in July and August. This carries us through till suddenly it's over. Now, Feast of Trumpets here, that may be when you're still alive and you hear the sound of the trumpet and there he is as he splits the eastern sky. Or it may be when we're gone and that trumpet sounds and when the dead in Christ shall rise. So this comes after the life is done. And you think, well, all of this is over. No, it's not over because I can promise you it's a circle. On the Jewish calendar, it's a continual circle of life from the blood to the glory. From the blood to the glory. Continually. The blood is echoed right here. This is when life is over. Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets. He comes back. David's home of follows. That's the judgment day. The blood is still the major thing. The blood never went away. The blood is still the major thing from Passover through atonement. Why? Because it's going to usher us into the glory. That's the only way we're going to get in. That's the only way we're going to have eternity is if the blood has been applied to our lives. Not just, and I'm saying this for the video because I, I have people who don't go to church who sit and watch the video and I thank God for them watching. Just believing in Jesus doesn't save you. The Bible says the demons believe in one God and they tremble. They have a holy reverence even now, demons, for the one true God. Believing in Jesus does not save you. Have you had a born again? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Have you had a born again experience? Has the blood been applied to your heart? Because if it has, then when the day of atonement comes, you've got a free pass. Your judgment has already taken place on that day because the blood has been applied. He looks at you and says, enter in. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the Feast of Tabernacles. Do you know the Feast of Tabernacles is the only one we're going to celebrate in the end time? The Bible says that. I'm talking about at the millennium. The Bible says, I think it's in Zechariah, all nations, it says, will go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the only one that's left remaining, but it couldn't have been done without the blood that goes through it all. Now, I'm going to leave this right here. And I want, to, I want to talk some more about the blood because I'm convinced more than ever that that's something we've got to emphasize here more is the blood of Jesus. And it's gotten a bad rap. My kids and I have talked about it. We mentioned it last week. The blood's gotten a bad rap, not just by the politically correct people that think we shouldn't talk about it. And you know they've taken it out of the hymn books, we said. But not only that, people have used it like a superstitious thing. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. You know, we, we, we see it that way, and that's tarnished it. Remember how we talk about the old paths here? There's a reason we're called times of refreshing on the old paths. The old paths of God, that means universal truth, not Laura and Mary days. Universal truth here. This is God's old path. Well, the church went over here with the blood. The blood was always his old path. The church goes over here and uses it like a magic of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus like it's a charm or something. So what did the rest of the church world do? That's ridiculous. Look at those people over there pleading the blood of Jesus, drawing blood of Jesus lines around everything. We don't need all that. 
Well, yes, you do. But you've got to get back to the original usage of the blood of Jesus. We can't go over here where all it is is a magic charm. We can't go over here where we say we don't need that stuff anymore. Right here is where we dwell with the blood of Jesus. You ask yourself, I'll, I'm asking you, the blood. People talk about drawing a bloodline. Is that scriptural? I, th I believe it is. The reason I believe it is, is first of all, you have the example of Passover, where they literally drew a bloodline on the door. I mean, literal. There's a bloodline on the door there. So that when the destroyer, because the Bible talks about it at one point, as the destroyer comes by, it sees the bloodline and it can't cross the bloodline. It has helped me so much to learn that the word, as we talked about for Yom Kippur, the word Kippur is like the pitch that, or the tar or whatever Noah put on the ark. We learned that last week. That's helped me. When I pray for my children every night and my husband, when I, he's at work, I pray at night before I go to bed and I plead the blood of Jesus over my loved ones. And I draw a bloodline around my husband at work. And when I'm drawing that bloodline, it, I literally can see myself sometimes like painting it on. Like, like Noah, when he's getting that ark ready, he's putting that pitch on. Maybe that'll help you when you visualize that. There's a reason Jesus used parables. He won't, you see stories, you see analogies and pictures, it helps you. So when you're talking about that blood of Jesus, biblically, there were bloodlines drawn. When Joshua, when it was time for Jericho to fall, remember what happened? They sent the spies into Jericho. There were two of them who went in. And when they went in, remember, Rahab the harlot. I mean, this was a harlot, people. This was a prostitute. But because she helped the people of God, then she said to them, she spoke it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. When she was in the pre-redemption period, she said so. She said, I want to be protected. When y'all come into this town, I ask that you protect me. Is that all she said? Protect me. My family, she even named extended family. Protect my family. Is that all she said? She said, in our possessions and all that we have. It was repeated. Yeah. When you, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I didn't know it was going this way. That I was getting into Rahab, but let's go this way. When you're talking about Rahab's story, when you see something in the Bible that's repeated, you need to pay attention to it. Because it's not repeated just so, because somebody got absent-minded and put it again. She said, I ask you to protect me and my extended family, and our possessions, and all that we have. So when Joshua hears the word from the spies, he said, okay, guys, we are going to do what she asked. And he repeats it all. Joshua says we're going to protect Rahab and her whole family and her possessions and all that they have. He repeated it. And then when they went in there and they protected her, the Bible says, to summarize that story, and they protected Rahab and her extended family, her possessions, and all that she had. How did they know to protect her? You know the story. The bloodline. There was a bloodline applied, and you kids may not know it. There was a scarlet thread. That was the signal. How do we know which is Rahab's house? We've never been to Jericho. Which one's hers? we got to protect her and all that she has. Even her possessions. They put a, a red, like a scarlet thread, hanging from where she lived. So they would pass by that and know, don't touch the home. Don't you feel this? Don't you touch that house. That's hers. Don't you touch it. Judgment cannot cross the bloodline. When you come to the Day of Atonement, judgment can't cross the bloodline. You got the blood applied. Judgment can't touch you. Can't touch you because the blood of Jesus covers you. The bloodline has been drawn. Rahab, the bloodline, had been drawn. There's that scarlet thread couldn't get near her judgment. It's the same today. It's the same for your life. Draw a bloodline around your life. Well, how do I do that, Leslie? One thing is you speak it by faith. I quoted to you Psalm 107 a while ago. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What redeemed you? The blood of Jesus paid the price for you. What does the blood of Jesus do? So many things. It justifies you. Do you know when it talks about the blood of Jesus, it uses a legal term. What, what Bible readers of that day would have seen that as a legal term. Like us, if we read something today, we see the word subpoena or, we, oh, court. Oh, yeah, they're going to subpoena him to come testify. When the Bible wrote about the blood, many times it used legal terms. The blood 
justifies you means it renders you a verdict of innocent, innocent, righteous, innocent. It justifies you. The blood does so many things for you. It not only justifies you, it redeems you. That's another legal term. When the Bible used the term redeem in the New Testament to talk about the blood, that's a legal term that means you've been bought. You've been ransomed. Almost like if somebody has a, a not a plea bargain, or you know what I'm saying, where you settle outside of court, you settle it. It's settled. Money usually is involved when you settle outside of court. The blood has redeemed you. That's a legal term. You're redeemed. The blood was a sacred thing that had this power. Even in the Old Testament when you had to buy animals, because you bought them. When you bought animals to sacrifice, they were costly sometimes. Now God made provision for people that didn't have a lot of money. You could buy a lesser type animal. But as a rule, if you were going to get the main animal, it cost money. And it was a sacred thing. Blood was always sacred. Oh, God, thank you for the blood. We talked about it last week. From the first, blood was sacred. From the first, blood cried out. Before the law, blood was sacred, always. When the Jews got the law, they had to make everything kosher. Most people don't even know what that means. They think, well, it means a priest said something over it. They blessed it. That can be part of it. But do you know that nothing could be eaten with the blood in it? Because the life was in the blood. The life is still, oh, I see this like I've never seen it before. The life is still so in the blood, and that's why the devil is attacking the modern church world to take the blood out. Because if he takes the blood out, there goes the life. Where's the life in the modern church? We say, where's the life? Everything feels dead. Where's the life? You've taken the blood out. Oh, thank you, Jesus. When your shoes are coming off, when I, I'm thinking right now of people that I love so dearly, and they're misguided to a point, but I'm believing God's going to bring them on along because they believe the church is dead. The church is dead. I know what we need to do. Add some upbeat music and have people, wow, we clapped our hands in church. I remember when I heard somebody say that, we clapped our hands this morning in church. And I thought that was cool because it showed a freedom they'd never had before. That's a big step. So don't, don't. Uh, make that you know seem like nothing or trip. Don't trivialize it. But that's not the answer. That's not the answer to give the life back to the church is to get a little upbeat music or even to say, wow, we raised our hands in church this morning. Wow, we didn't use a bulletin. That's all wonderful stuff. That's not going to put the life back into the church. The life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. When you make meat kosher, there was a certain way they killed it. We don't make our meat kosher as a rule. They had to drain as much blood as they could. And then they had to wash it to get as much blood off of it as they could. And then they had to salt it, soak it in salt to try to draw out whatever other blood was there. Then they have to wash it again. So when you buy kosher meat and you think, why does this cost so much? If you've ever bought it, I did once. A lot of money sometimes. Because there's so much that goes into making that meat kosher. The blood was sacred. You could not eat anything that had blood in it. We talked about last week how the blood cries out. If, an, if innocent blood is spilled, it cries out for justice. It cries out because there's power in the blood of Jesus. This marvelous substance that was poured out for us. Yes, we can draw a bloodline around our lives. Yes, we can. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And the redeemed of the Lord are people who are redeemed by that very substance, the blood. So we speak it. We speak it. Not as some magic spell. Not as some magic talisman and rabbit's foot. We speak it because we're the redeemed and His blood redeemed us. And we say it. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And I plead the blood of Jesus. And you say, well, that's just a term they use superstitiously. No. The term in the Bible... Plead is, is a Hebrew word. Actually, the original was reeve. Reeve is how it's pronounced. Reeve. It was a legal term, which meant to argue in a court case to try to get that person off. That's what it means to plead the blood, that you're arguing. Let the blood speak for you. Let the blood speak for you. The enemy... Can't you see what he's tried to do all these years? If you see, now I know that there's this big mystery of godliness as to the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and these three are, you know, they're one. And I believe Jesus was God in the flesh. I do believe the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in him fully. 
there's different roles for Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You can't deny that. If you see the Father as the judge, the righteous judge, the Bible says Jesus is our advocate. What's your advocate? That's your lawyer that's been hired on your behalf. Jesus is your advocate. He can use the blood because he shed his blood. He uses that blood to advocate for you to the righteous judge. The Bible is your book of law. That's the law book that we have. The word, the word, the word is your law book. Who's the accuser or the prosecuting attorney? That's Satan. He is the accuser of the brethren. So it's a continual court case. I want you to get this in your head, especially the younger people. Get this in your mind now that what goes on around you is like a court case. The, the, the righteous judge, Jesus is advocating for you. If you're saved, he's advocating for you. The devil's accusing you. But Jesus has got the case won because of the blood. Hallelujah. And because of the word, the book of the law is in his favor. So if you look at it this way, you see how the blood has a legal terminology here. Because how does Satan fool people? He convinces them that the blood's not a big deal because he knows that the blood is protection from sickness, poverty, any kind of disease, mental, physical. The blood is our protection. That's what redeemed us from it. There's no greater thing that was done to make us free from all these things than the shedding of Jesus' blood. So if the enemy can convince people that it's not a big deal, if he can let people not know their legal rights, when you plead the blood of Jesus, you're standing up to say, that's my legal right. This is my legal right. Sickness has no right to come upon me. Disease has no, has no right to plague my body. Not mine. Because I have the blood. Is a legal thing that I can plead as my case. This is for important people. This is important because this is the only way we're going to move further into the glory of God. Now, I do want us to read a little bit of scripture to go with it. I don't. I did last week. I didn't look at my notes, and I went back and said, "Man, I forgot some stuff. Some good stuff." We talked about the covenant last week. We talked about how the blood was used to establish covenants. I told you that the Hebrew term for making covenant was berit, which means literally to cut, literally to cut covenant. Matthew 26, 28, you don't have to turn to that. I can just read it. Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Only blood could ever take away sin. Old Testament and New, only blood. People today have it in their minds, I'll just be a good person. I'll just, uh, I'll send money to the relief funds. I'll try to go down there. I'll even go help. I'll do all these good things. Without the blood, it's just a good thing. Without the blood, I read something a preacher said one time, said every, all the new agers, all the uh, Christian science, all these people who have these different kinds of things other than Christianity, it's really just Christianity without the blood. They're still trying to do the good deeds, but it's Christianity without the blood. Now, we talked about how the blood justifies us. We talked about how it redeems us. It draws us nigh to Him. I'm going to read this one to you. Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of that's what brings people close to God. We, Satan has convinced people that the blood runs people off. It makes them go far from God. The Bible tells you a different thing, and the Word is the Word is the Word. The Word is true. The Bible says right there what I just read you. I'll say it again, Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Colossians tells us that the blood makes peace. Hebrews tells us that the blood purges our conscience from dead works. It sanctifies us. It cleanses us from all sin. And now I want to get into what we talked about last week. And I want you to turn to it again because it's so important. Revelation chapter 12. This is so key. Revelation chapter 12. And you know the verses we talked about last week. 11 and 12. Told you the story how Billy Graham said she was looking for a revelation of the glory and instead God took her to the blood. 
And when she said, God, why all these attacks? Why all these attacks? Some are from the open door of sin. Yeah. You open a door of disobedience, an attack can come on you. God didn't do it. You open the door. Another way that attacks come is a lack of watchfulness. A lack of watchfulness. The Bible says, be vigilant. And when you go to the Amplified, that be vigilant means be watching all the time. For your adversary, you know that verse, he's like a roaring lion going around seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says be vigilant. How can you be vigilant? The blood of Jesus. You continually watch and you continually hold that blood up. Well, I did it once, Leslie. It didn't work. Then you keep holding that blood up. As a standard, you hold it up. Because what does it tell us here in verse 12? Revelations verse 12, the last part of it. The devil has come down unto you having grown wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. And the secret to that, as we said last week, is verse 11. Back up a verse and you'll see how we can stop his attacks. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And what else? Love not their life unto death. They love not their lives unto death. We mentioned it last week. That there's a threefold thing. Man, we claim the first two parts of that. Woo! Overcome, you know, by the blood of the Lamb. By the word of our testimony, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Woo! We forget that last part. They love not their lives unto death. Sacrifice. Say, God, you're more important than anything else. I promise you, people of God, you take those three components, you're going to... Hallelujah. You're going to move in the glory of God. You will. You overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb. You put the blood in your life more. I think I got it in my life more in the last two or three weeks than ever. And I've seen a difference. I am still knowing that God let these warts. Laugh if you want. I believe it. I believe He let these warts stay on my finger purposely <coughs> for a time. Now they're leaving. This one's already flat again. Total, that's the big one that was hurting me just three weeks ago. Hurting even. Flat. Totally flat now. Why? God's got a purpose for everything He does. When I would go do everything I needed to do, oh, oh, Jesus, I'd quote scripture over it. I'd speak, you know, literally, in, I'd look like an idiot sitting in my kitchen every morning speaking to warts. I literally would go in my kitchen and start talking to them, telling them to go. I curse you at the root in the name of Jesus. All that stuff's good. But I kept saying, God, I know I'm, I'm being healed of other stuff right and left. Why not this? I kept feeling deep down like he was getting ready to teach me something. And when this blood message became so big to me, and I began to look and say, I plead the blood of Jesus over my body, over my skin, that no wart even can cross that blood. Hallelujah. Can cross that bloodline. Boom. They started going. That's no accident. He was showing me the power of the blood. So you take Revelation 12, 11, and you overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony. I believe that applies to the blood. Speak and use that blood and other things. And the final thing we can't forget, we got to know that we don't love our lives to death. We, we, we're sold out. That's the people who are going to enter into the glory of God. Those are the people who are going to see the miracles, the signs, and the wonders they want to see. You've got to have all three of those components, I'm convinced, to overcome the enemy. Because why don't we see the signs and wonders and stuff? Yeah, it's doubt. It's fear sometimes. It's unbelief. But a lot of times the enemy's fighting us to not let us recognize our power and our authority. We have to overcome him by these things. We are the people that are going to walk in that authority through this. Now, I want to read this statement to you. This came from, uh, we called him Dad Hagen, the one who got, went on already. Every benefit and blessing we possess in our redemption, including complete and total victory over Satan, say that again, complete and total victory over Satan, is based on Jesus and his triumph over Satan at the cross. We have victory over Satan because of Jesus' shed blood. The old-timers in Pentecost understood a truth about the blood of Jesus. They would plead the blood against the devil. That's 
scriptural. I agree 100% with Kenneth Hagin there. Now, you know, the Word is the key. If it's not in the Word, we can't, we can't base anything on a theory on anything unless we find it in the Word. But you also got experience. You can't deny experience. We told the story last week about the man with the foxes, the rabid foxes that were found dead on his property because he drew a bloodline. You can't make this stuff up. This is for real. I read about a pastor. His last name was Gossett. I thought of Christy up the road. Pastor Gossett. He read the story of the foxes and was so moved by that. He said, I'm a pastor and I have not done this. This is not something I've been moving in. It's this blood of Jesus. His office and his church kept being broken into. And they had set up security systems. Somebody was still breaking into the office. They had alerted police. Somebody was still breaking into the office. But after he heard the Fox story, he took a group of prayer warriors to his office, and he said, I plead the blood of Jesus over this office right now, and I draw a bloodline of Jesus around this office that no enemy could cross. Never had another break-in after he did that. Never had another one. Billy Brim tells the story of her son. I think it was Chip. Her, she has four children. Her son Chip was in college. He admits he wasn't living right at the time. He told her that. But when he was in college, they had an experience where they started coming home. Remind me of a dream you had, Megan. Think on it for later to ponder. They started coming home, and when they come home, all the doors were open of the little mobile home they were renting. Some, you know, young guys in college renting a place. Doors were all open, and everything turned on. All the appliances, the TV, everything just going loud and crazy. The landlord couldn't figure it out. He said, nobody else has a key. And there was no forcible entry. Nobody had a key. The landlord said, I, I can't figure it out. Well, they sort of thought, well, okay, that's a little eerie, but they didn't do anything at that time. And then one night, all of a sudden, this, I think two or three of them were home, three of them at least, they heard the front door slam. They looked and nobody was there. And then all of a sudden, the door to one of the roommates, not Chip, but another one, the, the door to his room opened and shut. Nobody. And as two of the boys were in the living room about to freak out, they, they admitted it, about to freak out, the door reopened and a dark hooded figure walked out and went out the front door. The boy who had been in the room came out and told them, he said, a hooded figure came in with like a, you know, the Grim Reaper kind of thing, came into my room and stood over me. He said, I don't know what to do. Well, that's the point that they left that place. No, whether, whether they's big old 20-year-olds or whatever, they took off and left and ran. They didn't have a phone. This was, her kids are old now. They had to go running to find a phone, and you know who they called? Uh, Chip's mama, Billy Brim, to tell her what was happening. And she told them what to do. She said, you go in that place and you pray and you plead the blood of Jesus over that place and you draw a bloodline around that place. They did it. Nothing else ever happened. It was gone. It was over. Her other son, Terry, was in college trying to live right but had to rent a place from some rascals. And when he was renting from some rascals and they'd have parties with girls and alcohol and all kinds of stuff, Terry was trying to study in his room one night. Now, he's the good one, remember. But he's trying to study in the room, and his bed literally levitated and lifted three feet off the floor with him in it. Freaked him out when that happened. And there was more that happened, but he ended up doing the same thing. He brought a preacher from the area in who believed, as he did, about the blood of Jesus. They pled the blood of Jesus. They drew a bloodline. Never happened again. It was gone. This stuff matters, y'all. The blood of Jesus matters. You say, I have lost children. You say, uh, um, I feel the enemy coming against me sometimes. You hold up hallelujah. Yes. You hold up the blood of Jesus. You hold it up. Because guess what? The best soldiers sometimes are not necessarily the strongest and the mightiest. I read this in a book. It said the strongest soldiers sometimes are not might. It's who holds on the longest. Who's persistent? Who says, we're not giving up this ground no matter what. We're standing right here. We're not giving it up. I'd rather have that soldier on my team than one that's got bunches of muscles. I'd rather have one that says, I'm not giving up. You hold the blood of Jesus over a situation. I don't see results. I don't see results. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You keep declaring that blood of Jesus because this is something interesting I've never thought about. Christians think all the time, I read this in her book, Christians think all the time, we got to hold out against the devil. Lord. 
Help me to hold out. Oh, we sang that song. We got to hold out against the devil. No. He's got to hold out against you. Amen. You're not holding out against the devil. He's got to hold out against you. Because you've got, hallelujah, you've got the blood of Jesus working in your favor. He's the one that's got to back down. You change your mindset. Don't see yourself as the little victim. Hold now. I'm holding the blood of Jesus. I'm holding the blood of Jesus against, uh-uh-uh. You change your platform, and you see yourself on that platform. I'm holding the blood of Jesus right now over the devil. He's got to go. He's trying to hold out, but guess what? He's got to go. Oh, Megan, come on up. Cause We ain't done yet, but we're close. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah. Now, with this blood of Jesus and this bloodline, and you keep applying it, and you, oh, this is good. I just found something else I forgot I had. John Osteen. You know, people talk about Joel Osteen sometimes. I am not going to touch that man with a 10-foot pole because I know his family. The Osteens that have been a holy family. I can't speak for what's going on now. I don't know, but John Osteen. There was a saying about John Osteen that every morning when he got up, the devil was like, oh, no, there he is again. I want that said about me. When my feet hit the floor, I want the enemy to go, oh, gosh, oh, she's awake. John Osteen said this. You don't overcome Satan by your tenacity. You don't overcome him by your good works. You don't overcome him by your goodness. You don't overcome him by your own holiness or righteousness. You don't overcome him by your mental agility and reasoning. You overcome him by the blood of Jesus Christ. So when you are holding that blood, it's not your persistence and your tenacity that wins. That's the trait you use. As you wield the blood of Jesus like a sword. That blood of Jesus is the only thing that overcomes the enemy. Now, here's what I'd like to say to you. I want you to start doing this very thing. Pleading the blood of Jesus. Drawing a bloodline of Jesus' blood around anything that's precious to you. Your home. Your possessions. Billy Brim tells the story of how she said she gets, she's flown thousands of times, this woman, across the world. She said she pleads the blood of Jesus over her luggage, that it won't be stolen, it won't be lost. And she said only two times has it been stolen or lost, and she remembered afterwards she was in such a hurry. She didn't speak the word over. You say, well, that's superstitious, Leslie. I'll just do it once, and it'll hold forever. Is that what you do, like I said last week, with healing or anything else? Or do you keep speaking the word? There's power when you keep speaking the word. Did you pray over your food when you were three years old? Did you say, God is good, God is great, let us thank Him for it? You know, did you say your blessing when you were three and you've never done it again? Oh, it holds from then. I pray over my food every time I eat. I try to, try to always remember. You continually speak the word. Just because you did it once, I heard a woman say one time, I just pray over all my groceries and then I don't have to pray over my food. When I bring them in the house, I pray over my groceries. Well, I'm not saying she can't do that. That's good. But I'm going to pray continually speaking the Word. Because the Word has power, power, power. Now, I am going to ask you to begin to do that over the things that are precious to you. You got a child that's lost? You start pleading the blood of Jesus yes. over that child. I draw a bloodline of Jesus right now around my child. Oh, hallelujah. You feel an attack come against you? You hold up the blood of Jesus. You say, no, the blood of Jesus prevents this from coming on me. I will not give in to this. I will not give in to this temptation. I will not. The blood of Jesus protects me. You, you plead it as a, uh, like you're in court. And you're saying, the blood gets me off here. The blood is the thing that says nothing touches you. Nothing touches you. The one scripture that I want to close with, whoever, just somebody that's still got your Bible open, somebody would close out with this for me. I'm going to go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. Somebody read me 9 and 10, and I would like the King James to close out. This sort of sums it all up. It takes you from Passover with the blood. It takes you into the glory because it's the continual circle. The blood makes way for the glory to come. You can't enter the glory without the blood. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're going to talk more about the glory, but I really felt to do it throughout the week. 
especially Wednesday night, which is our typical midweek service together. I want to get more into the glory of God, continuing with this, and even talk about the former and the latter reigns and how they're going to come together, the Bible says, for the glory of God. Because what is Sukkot all about? They're praying for rain, people. In Israel, they're praying for rain. But it all started with the blood taking them through to the glory. Who's got the Hebrews chapter 2? Who's got it? Is that the one I said? Did I say the wrong one? Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. King James, whoever can read it. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom all are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through his sufferings. Through his suffering, through the shedding of his blood. <coughs> He is bringing many sons to glory. That's us. He's bringing us back. It's all about going back to the garden. It's all what we learned all summer, even with Super Summer, back to the garden. He's bringing many sons to glory through His blood. His blood. Oh, Jesus. Enter in with me right now. And to my knowledge, I think everybody here in this room is, even, is pretty much baptized with the Holy Ghost. I believe everybody's saved, born again. But right now, before we leave, I want you just to begin to, to think about, ponder, meditate upon this word, the blood of Jesus. I'm stirred in my soul, church, more than ever, that what the old timers knew, that what the old timers used and walked in as a weapon of their warfare, that that's the key. That's the key for us to move, hallelujah, into that final outpouring of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty, God. I see that, Lord. They're pulling down strongholds. I see that, God. The weapons, the Word is my weapon. The name of Jesus is my weapon. The blood of Jesus is my weapon. Oh, God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for that blood that was shed. And then begin to move in it. Hallelujah. I plead your blood, Jesus, around, uh, around this whole property, even yes. including that hotel yes. lot. Yes. I plead the blood of Jesus and draw the bloodline of Jesus around it. That this is holy property, consecrated to your glory. God, the blood of Jesus protects these places that they may be used for your glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah.